We'll open your Bible to Leviticus chapter 15 and 16. If I was going to put a title on this, and I don't always do that on a Wednesday night, I would call it Clean Up Your Act. And uh, you're, going to see, you're going to see why literally that's a, a good title for this. But as we continue through Leviticus, God's law, which equals our liberty when we take it to heart and, uh, and we grow from that. I want to ask you this question that's up on the screen. Think about it for a moment. And if somebody told you, let's say, let's say you got arrested for being a Christian, and they're going to take your Bible from you, and they tell you, you know what, feeling merciful today, you can rip one page out of that Bible. What chapter in the Bible would you take as the only page that you were able to carry with you? Anybody got an answer? What, what, what would it be? 2 Timothy 3.16, for the Bible is profitable to be read for reproof. I gotcha, I gotcha, yeah, Bible's profitable. Anybody else? Who's got a, who's got a chapter? Yeah. John 17. John 17. Was that yours too? John 17, Jesus praying for you to hear that over and over again. Who else? He was way in the back. Jeff. Psalm 34. What is it? Psalm 34. Psalm 30. How's that one start? Uh, I uh, I've got it right here. Because <laughs> they haven't started ripping the pages out of my Bible yet. I've got, I've got them all. Not yet, that, but, you know, that day might come. I, I want to know what that one is, Jeff. Yes, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mind. Who, who else? Who else has one? Hebrews 1, yes. It's another one of those kind of in the beginning ones too, isn't it? Jesus above all, yes. Yes. Yes, amen. Psalm 115, yep. Philippians 1. What is it about that? Yes. Ooh, that would be good to take in to prison with you, wouldn't it? Yeah, he who began a good work is going to continue it. Any other Psalms? Any Psalm 23s? I mean, that one's so easy to remember. I would want to pick a bigger one that I, I, I didn't have memorized. But I'll tell you, one chapter that none of you would probably want to take if it was the only chapter, only page you could rip out would be Leviticus chapter 15. And maybe, and I didn't hear anybody quick to say, oh, I want Leviticus. Um, but it wouldn't be chapter 15. Uh, chapter 15 of Leviticus, where we are tonight, and we'll make it into chapter 16 a bit too, it has a definite, can I say this about Scripture? It has a, a gross factor to it, a yuck factor. And ooh, really? That's in the Bible. It really does. I have, I've taught through this book before, but I have never in, in all of my 45 years or so, maybe a little bit longer than that, of, of preaching Scripture, I've never preached a message like a Sunday morning message out of Leviticus chapter 15. And you'll probably see why tonight. There, there might be something in there that you could certainly turn into uh, a, a powerful message, but, uh, but I, I've preached from, you know, book after book and verse after verse, but I've never turned to Leviticus 15 for that inspiring message. I've never seen anything in Leviticus 15 on a memory verse card either, <laughs> not a single verse. I guess one, one verse that you, you could put in there is this one that's an easy one, verse 1, and the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, there you go, if you want to memorize that, you've got it. But the rest of it has a, such a oh, yuck, kind of a, a feel to it. And we're not going to read all of it verse by verse. I'm going to read the first half to you, and I'll explain why. I'm going to let you do some homework on your own tonight. But there's no bedtime stories in Leviticus chapter 15 for your kids, and you'll see why. And, 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 and as you said, Joe, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable all Scripture is profitable, including this book and this chapter, and that's why we're studying it, and that's why we should go home and read it. But, but what can we say in introduction to um, Leviticus chapter 15? And I think what we can say is that Israel had a very, very unique relationship with God, and it's typified in chapter 15. It's really all the way through Leviticus. There are guidelines that God puts down for his, his children that the rest of the world don't necessarily get. 
but for his people who were on a mission for him, and I'll show you, the unique relationship that God had with his people, I should say the unique culture, it comes down to this. Number one, they did have a unique relationship with Yahweh. And in that relationship, they were given a unique calling from Yahweh. Anybody remember what their calling was? It was given to Abraham. It was passed to Abraham down to his son. And God said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And through you, who's going to get blessed? All the nations of the world will be blessed through you. And that was their unique calling. And it, it was intended that that would come down to the Hebrew nation, the Jews, the nation of Israel, being handed by Jesus the mission to tell the whole world about him. But you're in, in, in John chapter 1. We're not there right now. But you turn to John chapter 1, and it says, well, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And it says a little further down the page, it said he was in the world. The world was made by him, but the world didn't recognize him. They didn't embrace him. He came to his own who were who? Israel. And his own did not receive him. So they abdicated on that mission to be the driving force to take the gospel to the world. And, and this isn't any boast. It's just the absolute truth that today the majority of the force of the evangelical, evangelistic, because you can be evangelical and not be evangelistic. You can be an evangelical with good sound evangelical theology and not be sharing your faith with anybody not be evangelistic, not be on mission. But the great majority of those who are taking on that task and that wonderful mission of telling the world are not Jewish. There's a growing number of Jewish people that are doing it, but by far the great multitude are Gentile believers. And, and, and Jesus came into this world to his own people to begin with, and he said, I got, I've got to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel first. And by and large, they rejected him, except for that small band of people. Well, I've got to plug this in, or we're not getting any further tonight, because I don't have that good a memory. How many of you remember what you wrote recently? Oh, this one doesn't work. It's not the right plug. And I'm, I'm down to 10%. It needs to be that other plug, and I didn't bring it with me. Somebody wants to run to my office and grab it off of my desk. You can, and we'll see how far we get. Okay, here we go. Oh, okay. Where was I? Oh, I know where I was. I was right down here. So that was the mission, and I need to run down through this. Unique calling from Yahweh, a unique weekly and yearly calendar, and you know that all the feasts that were scattered throughout the year. And what was the weekly calendar? The only day that has a name? The Sabbath, the Sabbath Shabbat. That day of rest for them. After that, they had unique dietary restrictions. We talked about that, a unique moral code. And it was a good moral code, wish the rest of the world would adopt it, but they haven't always adopted it. Unique worship practices, we've seen that, and we'll see that again through Leviticus. And then tonight, these unique health standards, and there's more. We've started in this, but this chapter is part of that health code for the people of Israel. And the scholars say it would likely have been in the first part of the second year after Exodus that chapter 15 is being given to the people of Israel. And these restrictions are being handed down to them. They're not in Egypt anymore, and, and, and they're not to live like Egyptians anymore. They're out of bondage, and God, line upon line upon line, is telling them, you are my people, this is how my people are to live, including these, uh, these gnarly issues we're going to talk about tonight. Some of you are wondering, really? Well, this is sounding serious. Have you read chapter 15 in advance? But it turns out that there are just so many ways for us to become unclean in this world. So, so many ways to get unclean. I, I looked through several of my commentaries for um, different authors' comments on Leviticus 15. <laughs> and I was surprised. This one right here. I love Warren Wearsby's uh, notes on Scripture. This is just the Old Testament. Uh, Wearsby's expository outlines on the Old Testament. And I've got a, a bigger one that is Wearsby's expository comments on the, on the New Testament. But you go to chapter 15 of Leviticus, and um, you see, well, right before it is chapter 14. Chapter 13 through 14, there's some outline notes. And you think at the end of chapter 14, there'd be chapter 15. He doesn't even say anything about chapter 15. Not one word about chapter 15. And I know why. I know why. 
You, you open up Pastor Chuck's commentary, and this is his very, very light Old Testament study guide, and there's about 11 lines on a, on a double column page on chapter 15, and I'll read some of those later. This one, how many of you have a Halley's Bible handbook? Anybody have those at home? They're, they're a great tool for just getting you started on a basic understanding of what Scripture is saying in any particular place. And here's chapter 15 right here. It's, a, it's about an inch on the page. And, there, and a, in a book like this, there's not a whole lot to be said about that, but it's just amazing how little there is in so many commentaries about this. So I, I found that very interesting. But the opening statement, how many of you use Blue Letter Bible? Does anybody do that? Blue Letter Bible is a great Bible study tool. And you can, get, you can get the Bible in countless uh, translations, and you can click on the, um, on, on, you know, the different uh, helps, click on the helps, and it gives you all kinds of stuff in there. And this is what it said uh, over, the, uh, over the chapter that we're going to read tonight or look at tonight. Opening comment from chapter 15. It is not necessary to consider in detail the laws contained in this chapter since they are sufficiently plain. And that's really true. They don't need a whole lot of interpretation. It's kind of right up in your face. It may, however, be observed that from the extreme measures which unclean persons were obliged to take, the washings and the quarantines which they must observe, and the restrictions they must endure in the way of commerce and traffic and involvement in society, basically, these laws were admirably adapted to prevent contagion of every kind by keeping the community and the diseased separated during the time of of their sickness. And, and that's a, a, about what you get from especially the commentaries that are, are just more of an overview on this. So I, I know you're eager to jump into this chapter now, aren't you? So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to, to let you read most of this chapter on your own later. Most, it's just a little bit more than half of it. And, um, and I know you're wondering why I would do this. So I'm going to explain this to you. I'll, I'll read the first half and then send you home to do some homework because the second half is going to be very, very similar. But here's why. Um, how many of you ever listen to our radio program? And you listen to it on the radio. What time in the afternoon? Are the kids awake at 4.30 in your home? <laughs> Most homes, the kids are awake at 4.30 in the afternoon. And maybe they're in the, the car with their, ki with their parents, or maybe they're home with their parents. But this chapter definitely has some PG-13 content in it because of the intimate details. And I just think it would be better for you to read that at home than me to record that here and somebody be driving down the 405 and have a, have a shocking moment and cause a collision somewhere. And I don't want to be responsible for that. But I do want to give you a guide on, on what we're going to read. I want you to remember a few important keys on this chapter, in Leviticus chapter 15. It is specifically directed to Israel. It's their guidelines on a certain element of their health code. Um, it is about ceremonial uncleanness. It's not about moral uncleanness. It's a kind of uncleanness that would keep you out of the ceremonies connected with the tabernacle if you were unclean in these ways that we'll be looking at tonight. This uncleanness is not about deliberate sin or rebellion or willful sin. And it's very similar to the treatment that you'd get if you were a leper. A leper wasn't a leper because he did something or she did something sinful. It's just something that happened to them. You didn't go looking for leprosy. You didn't, it, it's not like you stepped outside your house. And how, how many of you, uh, I'm not going to ask I'm not going to ask you to show your hands on this one. But, but we all, we all have had to battle with sin in our life and desires that we knew were opposite from, from God's purposes for our life. It's clear what Scripture says about you know, whatever sin, name the sin. And, and all of us have willfully walked towards sin at some point in our life, but nobody stepped out their door and thought, I want to get COVID today. I want to get leprosy today. I want meningitis today. Nobody does that. It's something that finds you. Somehow they had contracted this disease or whatever it was we're going to sp speak about tonight, but, but nonetheless, they had gotten it, they had... So, so to speak, they had tested positive for it and they were sick. And there was something that caused them to be separated from the community of Israel. So there's a couple of repeated phrases you're going to see over and over again in this chapter. 
that they would be bathed in water as a part of the ritual in cleansing, and they would be unclean until evening. Do you remember that? Remember that phrase, unclean until evening, in previous chapters? It was something that was ceremonial. It was to be taken seriously, and you were unclean until evening, sometimes a sacrifice, sometimes wash the clothes, be done with it, and then get on with your life. And don't touch that unclean thing again. But what I want to do now is read to you from verses 1 to verse 12. And whether you speak it out loud, there's going to be some point where you go, ooh, it's just in there. Verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. I I love, I'm going to stop already. (laughs) There is something to say about that verse. The Lord spoke to them together. There's other times where God speaks to Moses and said, tell this to Aaron. But now God is speaking to both of them together, somehow revealing this to him, saying this, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when any man has a discharge from his body, his discharge is unclean. And this shall be his uncleanness in regard to his discharge. Whether his body runs with his discharge, a running, oozing something, or his body is stopped up by his discharge, it is his uncleanness. Every bed is unclean on which he who has the discharge lies, and everything on which he sits shall be unclean. And whoever touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water, there it is, and be unclean until evening. He who sits on anything on which he who has the discharge sat shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. I guess whether or not something showed up on you, if you touched the unclean couch, chair, bench, or whatever on which the unclean person sat, oops, too bad, but now you're unclean until evening and you wash your clothes and you go on with your life. In verse uh, 6, he who sits on anything on which he who has the discharge sat shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And he who touches the body of him who has the discharge shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And again, that's not getting touched by whatever discharge came out of the guy. Other translations say an issue or something like that, an, um, an issue of blood or that sort of thing. You didn't have to touch the fluid or whatever it was, but touching the person made you unclean. Verse uh, 8, if he he who has the discharge spits on him, there's a lot of spitting going around this last week, isn't there? We had it on Sunday morning too. But if he who has the discharge spits on him who is clean, then he shall wash his clothes, bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. Any saddle on which he who has the discharge rides shall be unclean. Whoever touches anything, that was under him shall be unclean until evening. He who carries any of those things shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean till evening, which would be hours of separation between you and your family, I guess, when you got home and you washed and put the clothes in the washing machine and whatever you had to wash in. And whomever the one who has the discharge touches and has not rinsed his hands in water, he shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean till evening. The vessel of earth, so some, a piece of pottery or a, a jug or a, 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 a vase or something like that, a pitcher that's made out of clay. The vessel of earth that he who has the discharge touches shall be broken and every vessel of wood shall be rinsed in water. Isn't that just an encouraging passage of scripture? Aren't you glad you heard that tonight? What is this all about? This discharge, this issue. One translation says an emission. I should have warned you before I read that that if, if you're not going to enjoy this, you might want to put your hands over your ears and go la, 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 so you don't have to hear all that until we get through with it. But it was very serious business to them. These were all about bodily fluids, uh, some sort of a steady flow from a wound, or as it said in one case, uh, a, a flow that had stopped up the, 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 that person's body in one way or another. But it would be some sort of a, a steady f- flow from a wound. It could be blood, it could be pus, it could be mucus, bodily waste, reproductive fluids, all of that, whatever it was, it would make that person unclean. Now let me read this to you from Chuck's first. I like how concise Chuck was on this. Uh, this is Chuck over here. Then I'll, I'll read Hallie. This is what Chuck said. 
referring to verse 13. It is important that we realize that this was a ceremonial uncleanness in which they were not allowed to come to the tabernacle of God. If you had a running sore, you were not allowed to come to the tabernacle until you had gone through the seven days of washing your clothes, your body, everything. After the running sores had scabbed and healed, then you could come back to the tabernacle. That's all Chuck had to say on the chapter. So I don't know why I'm going beyond that. Something in me would love to go just there and say, let's sing another song and, and maybe four or five more songs to fill up our time. But here's what uh, Hallie said. So the elaborate system of specifications as to how a person could become ceremonially unclean and the requirements concerning it were, it seems, designed to promote personal, physical cleanness, good hygiene, and continual recognition of God in all ways of his life. God has something to say about every aspect of our life. There's been some comments made by a, a number of different writers that uh, point out the fact that there's not a part of us, listen carefully, there's not a part of us that hasn't been damaged by the sin we all inherited, making us in, in varieties of ways unclean, and especially in things like we're talking about here tonight. Man, it's just Good. Does anybody get the yuck factor yet on this? And you just hope, you, maybe you're glad you didn't grow up in that community where there were so many ways to be unclean. But I think the bottom line in, in this is that there were ways out of it to bring the person back in. And some of these, most of these, I think they would be private. Who would know that you had an issue? Who would know that you had some sort of, uh, of, of you know, this emission from your body if you didn't tell them? And so and unless it was something on an open hand or something like that that just kept running and running and running, who would know? A leper in his advanced state would, could typically not hide the fact that he or she had leprosy, but this person might be able to. But if they didn't tell anybody, then other people would be affected and not know it, and that's just not right. It's like having a positive COVID test and you don't tell anybody that you do. And you don't, you don't do anything to, to keep yourself from passing it on to somebody else. And I know those points are very, very much argued these days. But, but this point, you know, I'll go through this, this section that we read rather quickly and we'll make our way to chapter 16. But speaking of the, the extent of the infection and the impact of whatever this infection was, if they laid on the bed, the, the bed's unclean. And of course, they're unclean. Anything that touched, that they touched, that was unclean. You sat on the chair or the bench, like I said, that's unclean. Anybody that sat on a piece of furniture or on a saddle, that was now unclean. Anyone who touched the unclean person, just touched them, now they're unclean. And, and again, it could be the thing like in the, in, the, um, in the marketplace, where you're walking through the marketplace and you accidentally touch someone who shouldn't have been out because they should have been quarantined, but they decided, well, that doesn't apply to me. And so they're out, and then somebody says, that person's unclean, now you're unclean, and anybody you touched, and you just keep passing it on and on and on. And I do believe that all of these restrictions were to stop the flow of any kind of a contagious condition to anybody else. But earthen vessels, bowls, and such like that, that he touched were unclean, and they would need to be broken. But it says that the wooden vessels just needed to be rinsed. That's kind of cool. I don't know why the wood got away you know, from being burnt or crushed or whatever, but with the clay, stuff would absorb into that clay easier, possibly. But notice how long it was. You were unclean on most of this until evening, except for the person who had that flow of blood. And it was go wash yourself, wash your clothes, wash the furniture, but take it seriously and clean up as quickly as you could. Now let's get back to the unclean brother in verse 13 to 15. We've, we've read in the first 12 verses of just how this stuff spreads from one to the other, and it was the fear of it spreading that would make you want to stay away from those. If you heard the word was out, hey, you know, brother, brother, you know, Avi down the street, he's unclean. He's got something <laughs> oozing out of his body, so let's stay away from him and give him time to heal. But verse 13 says this, and when he who has that discharge is cleansed from his discharge, in other words, it's run its course, then he shall count for himself from the time that he's clean and the discharge stops. Then he shall count for himself a week, seven days for his cleansing, wash his clothes, bathe his body in running water, and then he shall be clean. But he's not done. 
because on the eighth day he shall take for himself two turtle doves or two pigeons. I think the pigeons would be cheaper than the turtle doves, and that's why there's an option there. Or maybe they'd be more readily available. And come before the Lord to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and give them to the priest, both birds to the priest. And then the priest shall offer them the one as a sin offering. But wait a minute. The guy didn't sin. Why does he need a sin offering? Because we're all, we're all in need of that offering. And again, I think it really speaks back to the fact that it's, it's sin that has brought the devastation to our entire world and all of our systems. And it's the blood of Jesus that was shed for us that cleanses that away. Even the stuff, as I said earlier, and I won't belabor this, even the stuff that wasn't intentional sin or a violation of any of God's commandments. It's a world that's in, it, it's infested with disease and sickness. And I'm thankful that there are doctors that are fighting these things and, and doing their best and, and, and trying to find better and better ways. But we live in a world that's broken because of sin and it is the blood of Christ that cleanses all of that. And, and anybody but me just thankful that you won't have to line up when you get in heaven for 15 vaccinations to be safe to be in heaven. Everything's gonna be safe when we get home. Ev absolutely everything. And so... Did, did I finish reading the 13 to 15? Yeah. So when the flow stopped, you're quarantined for seven, seven days, and then you bring the two birds for the offering, the sin offering and the burnt offering. Remember, the sin offering is just exactly what it says. It was an offering for sin and the impact of sin. And the burnt offering was a way of you saying, I am consecrated. I'm all in, Lord. May I be consumed by your power, by your grace. May I be consumed with a love and a passion for you. I'm all in, Lord. Take all of me. And we pray that way every time I lead somebody in prayer. Lord, the rest of my life and all that I am, it belongs to you, Lord. I'm not the king of my castle anymore. And notice it's water and blood together. Water and blood, water and blood. The washing that we get by grace through Jesus Christ and, the, and the, the cleansing from his blood. Water and blood together equals atonement. Water and blood together. I, I'm sorry, I didn't advance that slide for you. This is about reinstating the infected person. And the water and the blood, the washing and the shedding of blood equals atonement. Atonement is reinstatement and re-entry into the family of God. And that's good news, amen? Now, verses 16 to 33 that you're gonna read on your own, here's what you're in for. It's more ways to be unclean. Unusual discharges and a monthly cycle, the, the woman's monthly um, menstrual cycle, the prolonged flow uh, beyond the typical. And in, in, in that case with a woman, there's, it says, well, there's uncleanness there and there's a way to deal with that. And, but it, it, it's very interesting that because of the monthly cycle for a woman, she would have a week out of the month where She's kind of away from all of the, the flow of the heavy lifting for, for a week out of every single month. If it went on beyond that, there's other things to deal with there. So you're going to read that on your own. You're going to see much the same that we've read in the first part. But with the flow of blood, you remember Mark chapter 5? Do you remember Jesus has Jairus who comes to him and says, you've got to come and help my daughter. She's ready to die. And on the way to help the daughter... Who is it that reaches through the crowd but this woman who's had a discharge of blood, a flow of blood steady for a dozen years? That desperate woman who knew that she, she knew that she was violating protocol by touching somebody, especially what does she know Jesus is? I mean, at the very least, what does she look at him as? A holy man, a prophet. And you, with your uncleanness, you're going to touch the holy man, but as soon as she touched the tassels of his garment, m most people say it's probably not the, the hem of a garment, but the tassels, like the prayer tassels, the reminders to the Jews. You know what those tassels are all about? The tassels that hang down, you see them today still too, um, on both sides of a, of a man's uh, belt. They hang down and sometimes they're super long. Jesus spoke about that. You prolong your phylacteries. The phylacteries were these knotted strings with I think it was 513 knots representing each law that every Jew 
was responsible for keeping. And as you would, as you would walk through your day and you'd be swinging your hands, you'd, your hands would undoubtedly touch those strings and they were there to remind you, I have, I have promises to keep. I have laws to keep. And so all, all of those. And, and so she reaches, some say she reaches through and she touches his prayer tassels. And just like that, she's healed. And so it's not an issue anymore that she had an issue for 12 years. She's set free of that. And so you're going to read about that in the rest of the chapter. But there's really nothing more to add to that in the, in the contents of it. And you'll see as you read it why I didn't want to record that for the radio today. And the people that are reading on the radio, they'll go home and read it for themselves. But look over at chapter 16. We need to go a little bit further tonight. And we'll see how far we get. Leviticus 16 brings us to the highest holy day in the calendar of the people of Israel, the Day of Atonement. Everybody say Yom Kippur. Say Yom, not Yom, but Yom Kippur, which was the Day of Atonement and the days of awe leading up to that. There were days leading up to the Day of Atonement that were called, uh, if I'm pronouncing this right, Teshuvah. And Teshuvah were days of repentance. It was, it was a time to turn around. Not, not just turn in, in dizzying circles, but to turn from sin and identify sin and be restored to obedience to God. And it would come up every single year at the same time, the 10th day of the seventh month. And that would be on our calendar, what we would call between the 9th and the 10th month, somewhere between September 14th and October 14th. That's where Yom Kippur would always rest. It was the yearly reset it's kind of like our New Year's Day, but our New Year's Day has no religious significance to it at all. It's a day to, to fire off, what, the average 700 bucks a family in fireworks until 2 o'clock in the morning, or depending on your neighborhood. It's just a, a day of revelry for a lot of people. It would be a great day to stop and say, how did I do last year? How did I do on my, my goals for the year? My spiritual goals, my health goals, my, my mental health goals. Did I work any rest into my life? But it hasn't become that for most of us. But, uh, but Yom Kippur was that. Yom Kippur was, the, like I said, that high holy day where you got, you got a reset every year. Sacrifices for the sins of the people were offered for the deliberate sin as well as their accidental sin. That they, they didn't do it intentionally, but there was still sin and it needed to be atoned for. It was the most important day of the year for the Hebrew people, and they're told to take this very seriously. So I want to read to you from, from chapter 16, a couple of verses, and then we'll stop, and we'll go probably a little bit further. But look at verse 1. And now the Lord spoke to Moses. Now this is to Moses. After the death of the two sons of Aaron. Oh, you remember that, don't you? When they, they offered up strange fire on the altar, they just thought they could, they could make it up as they went. Hey, they're priests. They're high-ranking. They've got authority. They'll do what they want. And it was the last time they did what they wanted outside of the will of God because that day they died. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. So let me pause there. He gets the word. Moses, you tell your, your brother, who in that day probably still grieving for the loss of his two boys. And he said, you tell Aaron that that holy of holies, he's talking about this very center of the tabernacle. You'd come into this, uh, this tent, that was just, well, uh, it's probably another 30 or 40 feet longer than this, this sanctuary from this back wall to that, I mean, this front wall to that back wall and go another 30 feet or 40 feet or so, about that long and about half the width of our sanctuary here. 
And way back, if, that, if this was the entry door here where the curtains come together and, and you, would, you would step into the, the first courtyard where there was an altar for sacrifice and a brazen, uh, there was a bowl, the, um, uh, I think a, a bronze bowl full of water, the laver that was held up on the back of these, uh, these animals. And then you would go into the next tent because this whole outside courtyard was open to the sky. And you'd walk forward, and towards the back, there was another smaller tent which had a roof over it, a canvas roof or a tent, a, a, a roof of skins. And you'd go inside there, and that's where the table of showbread was, that's where the candlestick was, and that's where the, the altar of incense was, which you could almost say it's, it's pretty close to the dimensions of one of our offering boxes, about 18 inches by 18 inches square and about four feet high. And, and, and it backed right up to the curtain that went into the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies was that one place, and that's what's being spoken of here. He said, Aaron doesn't get to go in there anytime he wants to. He said, you tell your brother, don't treat the Holy of Holies like your, your, your little private office. It's not your private office. You get to go in there once a year. And you tell him to, that just because he's Aaron the high priest, he doesn't get to, to look at that as his own little private retreat or his own little getaway or even just his own little prayer room. I'm sure he would love to have gone in there day after day for some personal prayer time, but he had to find his place to get alone like every other Jew did anywhere else. But once a year, he would be allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. The privilege of the, of the office of the high priest and the whole order of the priesthood came with a really, really high responsibility. And what do you know was true of them that's also true of you? The, the priest Aaron and his sons. What was true about them that's also true about you? They're sinners. <laughs> They've got a privilege. What do you know about Pastor Bill? What do you know that's true about Pastor Bill that's also true about you? Did somebody say I was a sinner? Did so, do you believe that? Yes. I, I have an honor. I have a privilege of doing what I get to do, but so do you. And I don't, I don't get any shortcuts to relationship with God and to fellowship with God. I have to seek him out like everybody else seeks him. And I have to sit before him and I have to walk with him and I have to obey him just like everybody else does. So he says, tell, tell Aaron, he does not get to come just any time. I love the way it's, it's, it's said in my Bible. Just any time he wants. Hey, I think I'm gonna pop over to God's house for a little bit, honey. I'll be back for dessert. You don't get to pop in and out whenever you want to. I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. And let's go on. He says in verse 3, Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. And he shall put the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body. And he shall be girded with a linen sash and with a linen turban. He shall be attired. These are, his, these are holy garments. Wait a minute. Does anybody have a question about this? This is the high priest. What's missing? All those beautiful robes that we've seen that distinguish him from the other priests. Remember that? He had a different color garment. He had a different colored headdress. It was more like a crown looking thing. He had the urim and the thummim. He had the, the breastplate of all the, the gems of the tribe. But when he comes into the Holy of Holies, he says, you dress like the other priests. You dress in the white linen. And you approach me in that which speaks of holiness. These are holy garments. Therefore, he shall wash his body in water and put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. Now follow with me in verse 6. And Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering which is for himself. See, this holy man with a holy calling, still was a sinner that needed a sacrifice for himself on this day of atonement. So he would come in dressed like all the other priests that were to represent the people. And he would bring this offering for himself that day to make atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord 
and the other lot for the scapegoat. Everybody say scapegoat. The scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. That would be the day that it wasn't good if the lot fell your way because that goat's going to die that day. And the scapegoat, you could say, is going to live, but wait till you see where the scapegoat has to live. So the lot fell on that one and he will be offered as a, as a sin offering. Verse 10, but the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as a scapegoat into the wilderness. It's going to wander off into the wilderness. It's alive, but it's off in the wilderness, going whatever way it wants to go. So the, the point of all this is, is this evening, and we won't go any further than this. We'll I'll say a few things, but we won't go on any further on this. The whole, the whole point of this was, like I said, this day is a day of reset where the people who, who would assemble around the outside of the tabernacle, they knew what was going on inside there. They knew that there was bloodshed on their behalf. And they knew that God would, uh, would, would receive that offering that was poured on their behalf. And there would, they, would, they would have that, as I said, I've said it, what, five or six times, there would be a reset. And you know, they would walk away, I believe, on the Day of Atonement, though it's still solemn celebration. It would be with one of those, I've been talking about sighing a lot for the last week and a half. There would be this sigh of relief. <sighs> We're right with God. Our sin has been atoned for. And yeah, we spent those days of teshuva. I think it was 10 days leading up to atonement, thinking through what needed to change in our lives. Not making any more excuses, saying, oh, you know, we're God's people. He'll be gracious. Oh, it doesn't matter. Nobody knows. I won't get caught. But they, they'd confess their sins and in the best case scenario, they came with a heart to draw near to God and to please God. And for the next year, un until the next seventh month of their year, they would hopefully seek to live a life that was pleasing to God. But they weren't set right. They weren't atoned for simply because they flipped over that new leaf again. They knew that it had everything to do with what they couldn't even see that took place on the other side of the veil where the lamb died for them, the, the, the animal was slain for them, and the scapegoat, they'd watch somebody bring the scapegoat out and lead it outside the camp and turn it loose in the wilderness, and it was free to go. There's different opinions on that, and I'll talk more about that next week it is, you know, on all that that meant but you'd see the scapegoat taking off and it's kind of like we escaping from our, the penalty of our sin and we're free to run, and we're free to go but not to run back into the darkness again. So all of this, and let me wrap this up tonight, this yearly reminder of their need of a savior. Every year they would sin, of course, and every year this Yom Kippur would come around again and every year the innocent animal would take their place, blood would be shed, and they were clean, but just for another year. And they'd be back to the same ceremony the very same time the next year. Turn in your Bible, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. And this is where we'll close tonight. Because the writer of Hebrews, which I think is Paul, because Paul said, I, I know how to speak to the Jews and I know how to speak to the Gentiles. I think Hebrews is Paul's version of Romans for the Jews because it's so parallel in its content. So every year they would come back and, and these same representative animals would be slain again. And then it would be a clean slate until the next Yom Kippur came around. And so, in verse 10, uh, chapter 10 and verse 1, the writer of Hebrews says this, for the law that we've been reading, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, read it with me, year by year, 
make those who approach perfect. Ah, it doesn't. It atones, and it's okay, you're forgiven now, but it doesn't create perfection. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices that we've just read about, there is a reminder of sins every year. Read verse 4 with me, if you would. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats, we've just read that, can take away sin. Therefore, when he, see that capital H on he? When he came into the world, Jesus, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you've prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying sacrifice and Offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. But then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ. How long? How long? Louder. Once and for all. Once and for all. So we don't, come, we don't have to come back every year to find another Messiah to die for our sins. There's one word that you need to remember. You know it. You hear it every year around Easter. But there's one word, or on Good Friday, one word, to tell us die. What in the world does that mean? If you haven't heard that, then maybe you're new to the faith. It means paid in full. It is finished. We don't have to kill another, we don't have to kill another ram. <laughs> or I mean, no, did I say ram? I mean a bull. We don't have, the, the, the rams don't have, the ram doesn't have to die. Because the lamb died. Because the lamb of God died. Once for all. Could they all please raise their hands? Once for all. Not again and again and again. Oh, that has been so hard for our Hebrew friends to see it. That this was a picture. Because the blood of bulls and goats doesn't cleanse the sins of people. Their, their attendance to and their involvement in these ceremonies, it said a lot. It was their confidence of saying, God, somehow this all seems to work out in, from, from your way of looking at it that we're okay with you now another year and then another lamb has to die or another, another bull has to die, another goat has to be killed, another goat has to be set free and we walk through this over and over again. Well, we walk through this over and over again too, don't we? But not with the re-crucifixion of Jesus. We walk through this over and over again with a celebration of what? It is finished. We pick up in our little hermetically sealed you know, communion <laughs> kits we peel back the top and there's this little bite of bread and we remember the one sacrifice that was enough. We peel back the next tab and that little sip of juice is never enough for me. <laughs> but it is enough to remind me that his blood was spilled and I'm free. I am free and you're free. And if tonight you're not free, then you can be free tonight. You come to the one who shed his blood for you so that you could be set free and you could run free in his will, but not away from his will. Closer to him, not, not just off to seek your own will for your own life, but in that one sacrifice. Do you, you see the new covenant and the old covenant? Isn't it beautiful? And it's not just our, our, our sins. That's enough. That's more than enough. But even in the blood comes the healing. It comes the, the cleansing. And what we read about the gnarly stuff, and, and 15 is a gnarly chapter. All the gnarliness of us is set right and purified and cleansed by God. It's got it all covered and it's all wrapped up in Jesus. Amen? So, Father God, I, I want to thank you with the, just a, a, a heart of gratitude that you 
laid these pictures down. And for centuries, the worshipers had to be wondering, and you, we can even see it in some of David's writing. He, had, he, he wondered how all these animals' deaths could somehow spell out our cleansing and forgiveness, and he realized it was to you that he needed to turn. It always was to you, Lord. And so we turn to you tonight, God, and maybe some of us have to confess some sin and let go of it and turn back to your way and away from our own way, Lord, and trust you, Lord, with all the issues of our life, with all the, the stuff of our life, Lord, and really lay the burden of that down before you tonight. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hands, but as we sing this song, it, it might be more appropriate for some of us to, to sort of back out of the lyric for a moment and to identify what it is that right this moment that we need to trust Jesus with. I'm not going to give you a list of possibilities. You know what it is in your life that you've been wrestling with putting it in his hands and leaving it in his hands. I think it's in Psalm 111 or 113, I think. He stopped me in my tracks one day about a year ago. I was walking along and reading one morning. And it was the up and down history of the nation of Israel. God would deliver them and they'd run away again and he'd deliver them and they'd run away again. And it says, and, and at one point, he set them free and, and they thanked him and they walked with him. But, but it says this, but they didn't wait for his plan to unfold. And they begged for this and God gave them what they begged for and it brought leanness to their souls. That just really, it, it did. It just stopped me in my tracks that day. I want to wait for God's plan to unfold. I don't want to get ahead of it. So whatever it is, I've talked on too much. As we sing, take a moment and say, God, I'm trusting you with this. Give me your peace. Your shalom as I walk on. Father, hear our praise right now. Thank you for your capability, your, your, your strong arms, Lord, your wisdom love and your grace, your leadership, your guidance. Lord, teach us to trust you at this point in our life as we surrender these issues to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, I, I never thought about this. The animals that were predominantly used in the sacrifices are so much like us. Like lambs, like sheep that are always getting what? lost like goats you can tell a difference between a sheep and a goat because a sheep might say yes but the goats say yes but and then they butt you they're resisting and the bulls and how many of us are bullheaded at times this is very interesting that, it, that God chose those primary animals that are so much like us poor things had to die as representatives for us but boy you, you bring that prone to wander like a sheep or that prone to resist like a goat or that bullheadedness like a bull and say, God, I don't want to be an ox anymore. I, I just, I just, I want to be pliable in your hands. I just want to follow you, Lord. I want to follow you. So uh, may the Lord bless you and deepen your relationship with him, your knowledge of him and strengthen your resolve to follow him closely in days like this. Harder days are coming, I think. But we're going to make it, amen? We're going to make it. So suit up and keep your armor on and be ready for whatever comes down the road at us. And let's shine for Jesus. Amen. Thank you guys for leading us tonight in worship. Thank you so much. Thank you, Grace. God bless you guys. Thank you, too. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.